the psychedelic ibogaine has built a reputation as an anti-addiction magic bullet. I mean, we now even have the Wolf of Wall Street vouching for it. On the other hand, drug manufacturers who fueled the opioid crisis are forced to blow billions on lawsuit settlements, and Kentucky recently announced they might use some millions for ibogaine research. However, the clinical development of psychedelics is not as rosy as you might expect, much to the dismay of this gentleman investor, for example. These share price volatilities in some way reflect Ibogaine being a double-edged sword with case reports of severe and even deadly adverse events at high doses. This is why scientists pursue next-generation molecules that unify life-changing efficacy with superior safety. Sorry to some of you, but it would be nice if patients do not hallucinate. Join me on a journey to learn the biochemistry, therapeutic promise and chemical synthesis of Ibogaine and psychedelics-inspired medicines. How can we even know if these drugs might help, let's say, heroin addiction? To make sure you absorb this and all other facts in this video, feel free to pause and come back to it over multiple sessions if needed. Let's start with the basics. Iboga comes from the bitter root bark of the Tabernanti Iboga rainforest shrub native to West Central Africa. Beyond traditional medicine, Iboga also has a long-rooted, pun intended, importance to spiritual practices. From a Western perspective, its ritual use was first documented by French and Belgian explorers in the 19th century. It was evident early on that high Iboga doses can induce powerful states of mind but can also have toxic side effects. On the other hand, tribal hunters used much smaller quantities as mild stimulants, so these guys were already deploying microdosing before it was cool. Its recent history is reminiscent of other substances as it also meets what you could call the 20th century psychedelic starter pack. Was Iboga once sold commercially as a dubious extract just like psilocybin or heroin? Check. Did the CIA run unsettling experiments as we've seen with LSD in search of agents for warfare or mind control? You bet. And did the FDA classify Ibogaine as a devilish Schedule 1 drug? To the dismay of people like Howard Lotsoff, who started to report anecdotal evidence of potent anti-addictive effects. Check. Although it was indeed abused by athletes as a doping agent, this classification dealt a blow to Ibogaine investigations. While some early clinical studies were funded in the 1990s, many were terminated and progress was quite sluggish. Before we can understand medicinal effects, we need to understand that Iboga bark is not a pill, so it contains numerous natural products. This table from a mass spectrometry study just shows ones with over 1%, so the full list is quite long. Like we've mentioned for psilocybin, it could be that some of these phytochemicals support some sort of entourage effect of Iboga. As the major alkaloid present with 2% of total bark weight, Ibogaine is our primary molecule of interest. Here's a fun fact that some of you might find interesting. Iboga even contains yohimbine, an alkaloid used as a dietary fat burning supplement. In the body, Ibogaine has a half-life of roughly 7 hours. After ingestion, metabolization through a demethylation pathway kicks in, catalyzed by several different cytochrome P450 enzymes. The resulting nor-ibogaine with the free phenol group is more persistent. With such a long half-life, it's quite evident why iboga usually results in psychoactive effects over 24 hours, longer than most psychedelics. However, despite intensive research, these molecules' mechanisms are not properly understood. I mean, just look at this table. I'm sure you will agree that it seems complex. Unlike psilocybin or LSD, the hallucinogenic properties of ibogaine are not linked to serotonin 2A receptor activation. This sets ibogaine apart from classical psychedelics. Nor ibogaine displays submicromolar, so quite strong, agonistic affinity to the kappa opioid receptor. This profile is reminiscent of the hallucinogenic natural product salvinorin A, which is present in the leaves of the Mexican salvia plant. Nor ibogaine is also a strong partial agonist of the related mu opioid receptor. This is the target of classical opioid analgesics such as morphine and fentanyl, commonly used as sedatives or to treat severe pain. These agents are usually very dangerous, highly addictive substances. They are behind the extensive opioid overuse in the US. But as we will see, due to the breadth of molecular mechanisms implicated, ibogaine-derived substances could be helpful in overcoming opioid dependencies. Another key mechanism is the inhibition of NMDA receptors, similar to drugs like ketamine and even alcohol. This might explain the dissociative effects of ibogaine shared with these other agents. 
NMDA receptors are glutamate-gated ion channels which drive neural processes like learning, memory and neuroplasticity. I'm not saying that randomly taking drugs can help neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, it's probably counterproductive, but there is a molecular link here as well which is quite interesting. I wanted to highlight two other mechanisms. Firstly, inhibition of serotonin and dopamine transporters. The two micromolar Ki value for ibogaine and noribogaine essentially match the affinity of amphetamines. Ibogaine differs from these notorious drugs of abuse as the serotonin uptake inhibition is non-competitive. This and other reasons are why ibogaine has a lower abuse potential than cocaine for example, another inhibitor of this class. This mechanism might be behind ibogaine's effect on mood and psychological performance. Finally, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor activity is perhaps most likely accounting for the anti-addictive properties of ibogaine. Ibogaine is a non-competitive antagonist at several receptor subtypes, most notably the alpha-3, beta-4. This receptor is an important part of reward pathways and blocking it can dampen dopaminergic activity and reduce self-administration of various drugs. Beyond this, ibogaine also induces upregulation of GDNF, a crucial neurotrophic factor that promotes survival and plasticity of neurons, amongst others. This effect is also hypothesized to drive the attenuation of drug craving and use by ibogaine. Now we've established that ibogaine bridges several different classes of psychoactive substances. This translates into promising clinical efficacy, particularly in substance use disorders. Most ibogaine studies lack rigorous clinical study design, however there are good data in opioid and cocaine craving. Let's briefly check out the largest study, comparing self-reported mood and drug craving measures of opioid or cocaine dependent patients. Strikingly, after an oral dose of ibogaine, patients reported significantly lower levels of drug craving. This was measured through a questionnaire which tests patients' confidence and ability to quit, emotionality and other factors. In addition, depressive symptoms got better as well. These improvements continued to grow after one month follow-up, indicating potentially quite durable benefits. There are many other conditions being explored with preliminary data, but we will not talk about them in detail here. In any case, the upsides look quite promising, but what are the downsides? Ibogaine's complex pharmacology leads to considerable potential to generate adverse effects. In rats, high doses were shown to lead to the degeneration of neurons. This was not replicated in primates, so it might be species dependent and less worrisome. However, high doses have also led to tremors and convulsions in rats. Much more importantly, ibogaine can also negatively affect the cardiovascular system by prolonging the QT interval of the heart. This comes from a strong inhibition of HERC potassium ion channels which coordinate the heart's beating through repolarization of cardiac neuromuscular junctions. Abnormal QT intervals increase the risk of developing heart rhythm problems and even sudden cardiac death. That's why alarming reports of life-threatening complications associated with ibogaine have been accumulating. As you can see here, even young people with no other substance use are potentially at risk. Due to the longevity of the metabolite nor ibogaine we mentioned, cardiac adverse events may also occur several days, in some cases weeks, after intake of a single dose of ibogaine. So before we start testing ibogaine in dozens of conditions and in doing so potentially give patients sudden cardiac arrests, we should instead explore safer ibogaine-related molecules to unlock its therapeutic potential. This research needs to elucidate the underlying mechanisms of actions and should be, if promising, translated into more robust objective clinical trials in humans. Our content and most of today's impactful science is highly interdisciplinary. Want a free and easy way to quickly become a science all-rounder? This video sponsor Brilliant.org is the best way to go from novice to master across a wide range of scientific disciplines. Brilliant is well known for its interactive guided lessons in math, data science and computer science, allowing you to explore basic and advanced concepts at your own pace. In addition, Brilliant also breaks down various topics related to chemistry, biology and physics. For example, if you're interested in the biochemical aspects of my videos, you can check out Brilliant to learn more about protein folding and computational biology, unifying data and natural sciences. Maybe you're more quantitatively inclined and interested in statistics, like the clinical data charts we review on this channel.
Brilliant's in-depth course can help you understand everything from probability and variance to hypothesis testing and experimental design. With this broad base of lessons, you are ready to conquer any scientific topic. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash total synthesis or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Back to medicines, so how can we shift the balance towards better safety at similar or even better efficacy? The first attempt at this is an investigational molecule called 18MC. 18-methoxychoronaridine, as you can all tell from its structure, is simply ibogaine decorated with an additional methoxy and methyl ester group. If you want to know how it's made, stay tuned for the last chemistry section. These new functional groups impact the pharmacological profile quite a lot. The video is already plenty long, so we will not discuss the details here, but let's take a quick look. For instance, low activity at sigma sites reduces the risks of neurotoxicity, while the lack of activity on serotonin transporters means that 18MC is not hallucinogenic. Interestingly, the activity at the alpha-3, beta-4 nicotinic receptor is much lower, but 18MC is much more selective for this subreceptor than ibogaine. So we can see in some cases that a lower affinity is not bad if it is more targeted. A more complex point is also that this table only shows binding affinity, but sometimes an equally strong affinity expressed as Ki can have a much higher IC50 value, which reflects true inhibition. Unlike ibogaine, however, 18MC does not increase GDNF expression, the additional factor believed to be critical for neuroplasticity, so their mechanisms of actions are potentially distinct. Overall, 18MC seems to have a much narrower spectrum of actions. In theory, this drives a greater therapeutic index, meaning the effective dose is much lower than a potentially harmful dose. Regarding cardiotoxicity, 18MC inhibits HERC channels roughly 3 to 4 times weaker than ibogaine. It's not fully clear whether this is enough to abolish the arrhythmia and cardiac adverse events. Just shortly, we will check out the second analog, which is even better. The clinical fate of 18MC is not clear either. The biotech MindMed, don't confuse it with MindCure we've seen, completed a phase 1 trial last year with a solid number of patients dosed. They noted positive initial data and that the drug was well tolerated with no serious adverse events. A subsequent larger proof of concept trial had been planned. However, due to financial reasons, it was put on ice, stating new financing and partnering would be required to advance the program. Instead, the company is focusing their efforts on the development of LSD in phase 2 for anxiety and ADHD and MDMA preclinically for autism spectrum disorder. To learn more, check out the other videos on this channel. As we've seen, these drugs might be very promising in these conditions. So, who knows, if these prioritized programs deliver strong data later this year, 18MC might be resurrected. Drop a comment if you would want an update on these programs in future. In any case, fortunately there has been a promising addition to the analog roster. A 2021 paper in Nature reported the results of another quest into ibogaine analogs. Instead of throwing more groups on ibogaine like 18MC, the logic here was to simplify the structure, thereby improving accessibility and elucidating which features are most important for activity. In case of the ibogaine skeleton, you can envision two different simplified ring systems, one in light green and one in blue. Out of many compounds, the most promising was called tabernantalog, featuring a shifted methoxy group compared to ibogaine. Before we check out why this molecule seems to hit the sweet spot of safety and therapeutic effect, do you have an idea how to synthesize TBG? Even though it's quite sizable, it can actually be made in a single step through a fischer indole synthesis. The reaction links this substituted phenylhydrazine with the 7-membered ketone, creating the tricyclic TBG. This mechanism is discussed during many undergrad courses and pretty simple. The initial condensation reaction forms a phenylhydrazone, which isomerizes to the enamine form drawn here. Upon protonation, we have a sigma-tropic rearrangement which creates the C-C bond. After a re-aromatization, the nucleophilic amine drives the C-N bond formation via the aminal, which eliminates ammonia under acidic catalysis. 
the full syntheses of ibogaine will be reviewed in the final section of this video. But you can already guess that making TBG in a single step with 55% yield is infinitely easier than synthesizing ibogaine from scratch. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, please drop a like and comment. So what's exciting about TBG? Let's learn how its key properties are evaluated experimentally. First up is hallucinogenicity. While appreciated by some folks, pharmaceuticals should not elicit hallucinations in patients. Seasoned channel viewers will recognize the classic head twitch response assay to test for hallucinogenic potential of molecules. As a positive control, we have 5-methoxy DMT which is strongly hallucinogenic, reflected in the frequent head banging of mice. In red we have what is called IBG. This is not ibogaine but rather the simplified version with the methoxy at a constant position. Even lower than IBG was TBG in blue with essentially no hallucinogenic potential. So these were some sleepy mice instead of the energetic headbangers for 5-MeO DMT. Remember ibogaine's adverse cardiac effects mediated by the Herc channel? Both simplified analogs were shown to be much weaker inhibitors than ibogaine. The simple shift of the methoxy position between IBG to TBG comes with an additional 7-fold reduction in IC50 value. The overall 150-fold weaker binding gives TBG its promise as a quote-unquote safer ibogaine. Obviously, this is much better than just a 3 to 4 fold difference between ibogaine and 18MC, the first analog we talked about. So, safety is just one part of the equation. But does TBG also bring similar positive effects? Here's where we want to review just a few interesting experiments, starting with neural plasticity. This is the ability of neural networks to change through growth or reorganization. One way to look at it is the growth of dendrites. These are nerve cells extensions which propagate electrical stimuli. Exposure of rat neurons to ibogaine, IBG or TBG all lead to more dense dendritic spines. Qualitatively, we can simply tell from this image here. Quantitatively, the researchers performed a so-called Scholl analysis which characterizes the morphology of neurons. On the y-axis of this graph, the number of crossings is used as a metric for dendritic complexity. From the dark colored bars, we can see that ibogaine, IBG and TBG all trigger higher growth than the vehicle comparison on the left. Strikingly, upon pretreatment of neurons with the compound ketanserin, this growth is effectively blocked. Because this molecule is a serotonin 2A receptor antagonist or blocker, this tells us that these neural changes are being mediated through this pathway. As a side note, we can actually distinguish if this growth is being driven by a slower breakdown of spines or instead by a higher rate of formation. The middle bar called DOI is a positive control, an amphetamine related molecule which activates serotonin 2A receptors. Both DOI and TBG drive growth in the same manner, they accelerate the formation of new dendritic spines. Do these psychoplastogenic effects translate into behavioral or anti-addictive effects for TBG as well? We pointed out there are anecdotal and initial clinical reports that ibogaine can reduce alcohol or opioid use. For this analysis, you unfortunately must make mice alcoholic by giving them the option of binge drinking. After standard 7 weeks protocol, alcohol consumption was compared between mice who proceeded as usual, simply receiving a blank vehicle injection, and mice who received TBG prior to the drinking session. The latter group had much lower alcohol intake both during the initial part of the consumption test as well as acutely over the following days. The team observed similar effects when looking at heroin as another substance with high abuse potential. Here TBG administration also led to a much lower heroin intake seen on the left graph and also their seeking behavior as seen on the right graph in terms of number of lever presses during their experiment. I don't want to cover the experimentals in detail to not trigger people who dislike animal experiments, but if you're interested you can check out the paper. As a last notable effect, we look at TBG's impact on depression. This is done by subjecting mice to what's called a forced swim test, with less depressed mice expected to spend more time in motion, put simply, somewhat reflecting their drive and will to live. Even though also quite controversial, all marketed antidepressants increase the swimming time in the FST, so the test is legit. The researchers performed two tests, one 24 hours after administration of TBG and the second after one week of rest. 
This time the Planck positive control bar is ketamine, an effective antidepressant. During the first test, both ketamine and TBG reduced immobility, translating into lower depression. Adding ketanserin once again abolished the effect, as you can see in red. Interestingly, ketamine's effects seemed more durable, as it led to significant lower immobility one week after administration. TBG, on the other hand, looked more like the vehicle control. We discussed previously that ibogaine and its metabolite noribogaine interact with numerous biological targets. Unlike noribogaine, TBG or IBG showed no activity at opioid receptors. Perhaps the higher selectivity could lead to a better drug profile down the line. On the other hand, the control experiments with ketanserin already showed us that serotonin receptors are vital for TBG's activity. A more detailed screening revealed that TBG is both an agonist of the serotonin 2A receptor, but also an antagonist of the serotonin 2B receptor. Let me know in the comments if you need some more explanations on how to read these charts. The interesting thing here is that many 2A agonists are also 2B agonists, which can lead to side effects like heart valve disease. 5-methoxy-DMT is a key example. As you can see in the orange plot, it inhibits both receptors in a similar manner. This case study was rather simple on the synthetic design part of things. Still, I think it's really fascinating that TBG looks like ibogaine but seems to behave differently mechanistically. Although much work on translational science into humans and dosing optimization is required, TBG might be able to overcome ibogaine safety limitations and unlock the potential of this class of drugs. And last, a brief note on MindCure. This biotech company was pursuing the development of ibogaine, garnering some attention from professional and private investors such as the chap we saw during the intro. They supposedly were on track to have fully synthetic GLP supply of ibogaine ready by end of last year, but ironically just two weeks after this reported the result of a strategic review, the discontinuation of all business activities. As we see the psychedelic pharmaceutical market can be quite volatile and funding challenges in recent years have definitely not helped these companies either. As a random side note, their website seemed dubious from the start, as they didn't really get the molecular structure of ibogaine right, unless they were showing some other analog which I missed. So all in all, there are promising evolutions, but progress is sluggish. I expect that we are still far away from regulatory approvals. Instead, emerging clinics in countries where ibogaine is legal will continue to draw visits from abroad. They might be helpful for some individuals as a last resort, but come at the risk of sketchy medical practices and questionable patient safety. On the positive side, we do see increased state and federal interest in ibogaine and psychedelics more broadly due to the opioid problem. For instance, Kentucky is currently considering the allocation of $42 million for ibogaine research. Out of a much bigger pocket of almost a billion in settlement funds that they will receive, this looks like money well spent on larger and broader clinical trials for ibogaine. If you're still watching, you have my sincere respect and thanks. Now we will pivot to organic chemistry. The synthesis enthusiasts will appreciate that we will discuss not one or two, but three different approaches towards the ibogaine framework as well as the synthesis of 18MC. From a retrosynthetic perspective, given the high complexity of the ibogaine scaffold, there are various disconnections that lead to sensible synthetic approaches. A quite straightforward option would be to use the Fischer indole synthesis we've seen with a simpler ketone. However, most approaches include the indole from the start to guide the synthesis and reactivity. One method we will review uses transition metal catalysis, while others harness the electrophilic nature of the indole ring. The gram scale synthesis we will look at uses yet another approach based on nucleophilic substitution at the aliphatic nitrogen. Note that some of these syntheses focus on ibogamine, which is not a controlled substance. It's basically ibogaine lacking the methoxy group, but the chemistry would be quite similar for both. Let's start with the pioneering first total synthesis of ibogamine, published by Büchi in 1965. It started from this pyridinium salt, which was reduced to the diene. This prepares the deals all the reaction with methylvinyl ketone, which nicely builds the isoquinoclidine core of ibogamine. 
Next, some redox and functional group interconversions produce the following intermediate. There are quite a few reactions going on, so we won't go into them into detail, but this is a nice exercise for the motivated viewers. Now the hydrogenation of the benzyl protecting group released the nucleophilic amine, which is coupled to this indole bearing an acyl chloride. The next task was to create the central CC bond to connect the rings. This was achieved in two steps. Under acidic conditions the indole attacks the adjacent ketone and the resulting adduct was reduced with zinc and acid. A few more steps were needed to get all ducks in order. First, a reduction removed the acetate protecting group and partially reduced the amide. To get to the fully aliphatic amine, they had to take a slight detour due to the reactivity of the system. Elimination of the hydroxy group with a base temporarily cleaved the isoquinocladine ring. The link was regenerated by reduction with zinc, which is mediated through the unsaturated ketone at the bottom. Finally, a Wolf-Kishner reduction with hydrazine removed the ketone and gave the product. All in all, not bad for 1965 for sure, but can we make this a bit more efficient? That's exactly what the second synthesis is about. It starts off with a palladium catalyzed heteroannulation to forge a highly functionalized indole. You will note that the ring contains a methoxy group, so this is indeed a proper synthesis of ibogaine. Next, two iodide groups were introduced, first at the indole by treatment with the electrophilic NIS and secondly at the aliphatic position by deprotection and SN2. This reactive iodide might remind you of the acyl chloride we saw in the 1965 synthesis. Again, it allows the introduction of the isoquinoclidine ring through another substitution. This can be made in a similar fashion as we saw as well, so these synthesis do have some parallels. Interestingly, the authors noted that when using potassium carbonate as a base, there was a significant degree of intramolecular cyclization to the cyclopropane. This could be suppressed by using cesium carbonate instead. Finally, the indole and the ring were bridged through a reductive heck coupling, which after elimination already gave our product ibogaine. This synthesis is definitely more efficient and direct. But is there anything cooler? Three times a charm today. Quite recently, a paper described the gram scale synthesis of a bogamine in just 9 steps and an impressive 24% overall yield. Most notably, this approach would provide ample material to pursue even more synthetic analogs, particularly ones with more complex and different structures than TBG, which we've seen earlier. The synthesis started from this vinologous ester. First, a simple silylation protected the primary alcohol. Then, a stork Denheiser transposition with the Grignard reagent formed an enone, now bearing the ethyl group present in ibogamine. Through a Mitsunobu coupling, this fragment was linked to an indole bearing an amine. So this contrasts with the previous synthesis where we had an electrophilic indole partner. This one is nucleophilic. The ketone was then selectively reduced under Lush conditions and acetylated to create an activated allylic system. This sets the stage for a pivotal friedel crafts reaction, which as we've seen can be mediated by Bernstedt or Lewis acids. After some screening, the chemists found decent conditions with catalytic CSA and lithium perchlorate at a 5 molar concentration. This however meant that the scale up would require massive amounts of perchlorate. Initial optimization attempts were not fruitful as they either had to keep the quantity of perchlorate or dilute the mixture to an unpractical 0.001 molar. Ultimately after trying enough conditions they got good conversion employing only two equivalents of magnesium perchlorate. Finally the only thing left was the formation of the CN bond on the isoquinoclidine. You might remember that we highlighted this as a key retrosynthetic disconnection at the start. First the double bond which remained from the enone was hydroborated and activated as a mesylate. And last, the nitrogen was deprotected which immediately triggered the intramolecular SN2 reaction to give ibogamine. The whole exercise delivered 1.1 grams of pure product in one go. To conclude this video, let's check out the initial synthesis of 18MC starting from tryptamine. As you can imagine, it will be a bit more complex than ibogaine given the two additional functional groups. The route starts off with a condensation of tryptamine to the ketone of this fragment. If you're still awake, you will notice that the ester group present here ultimately ends up in 18MC due to the alpha chloro group. The product can undergo an intramolecular substitution, creating a transient aziridine and rearrange to the expanded 7-membered ring. 
then the double bond can be reduced and the nitrogen protected. The unique thing about this system is that upon heating, a retro 1-4 addition can fragment the ring, liberating the free amine and the alpha-beta unsaturated ester. Why is this helpful? Well, by condensing the amine with this aldehyde, a de-aromative deals all the reaction can be triggered. As a side note, doesn't really matter down the line, note that because the intermediary E-enamine was preferred, the product has the substituents in transpositions. Also, the newly introduced piece features the methoxy group we want to have in 18MC. So now it's all about linking up the rings properly. First, a conjugate reduction regenerates the aromatic indole and releases the quaternary carbon. Next, a hydrogenation unveils the amine, which upon deprotection of the aldehyde forms yet another cyclic enamine. Redrawing this structure, we realize that just a final ring closure is needed to create 18MC. This was achieved by simply heating the educt in toluene because the additional ester group proved very handy here. It's likely that an intramolecular proton shift facilitates the formation of an anion and iminium which can react to create the quaternary center and deliver 18MC. This synthesis did seem a bit random and there are maybe more efficient routes that are more analogous to ibogaine, but I thought it was quite nice that they used the additional ester group to guide their approach. This concludes our ibogaine journey. I hope you learned several new interdisciplinary science facts today. If you liked this video, consider becoming a channel member and activate notifications for future videos. Thanks to all my viewers and supporters and I will see you all next time.